Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tuesday Night Life, where we're going to gather and look at some questions in reference to our New Testament reading plan. So we've been reading this from the start of the year, 1st of January. Uh, we've worked through a, a fair number of portions now. And uh, just in this last wee while, uh, we've got into some of the letters in particular. So it's been great to see and receive uh, these questions. As always, more questions than we can possibly answer. So we've had to trim them down. And once again, we're going to have a total of six questions um, answered uh, by the three folks here. And uh, we're, we're limiting ourselves to five minutes each. So. You know me, I'm Scott from Brighton's. We have uh, Sandra, who's locum at Blackberry Shield Hill in Muir Avonside. And we have Jim, who's locum at Lorsting and Reading in West Quarter. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you with us. So another Braze effort, and it's uh, good to know that there are still folks out there in the other Braze churches reading along with us. Uh, it's been funny hearing some comments back from a few folks that have been saying, Oh, this has been a wee bit harder going, and particularly Hebrews. Um, so I think um, one of the comments I heard was, it's kind of like wading through mud or, or treacle and such like, and I, I can get like that at times. But I think one of the, the good things about this reading plan in this current form is that it gets us reading bits that we might not otherwise, and maybe gets us asking questions that we might not otherwise have thought to ask. So there are benefits in this, but I feel it myself, um, reading through Hebrews, um, even though I studied it at college as a module, I was like, what? Oh, I can't remember all this. And so, yeah, I was there too. I felt your pain, uh, but also hopefully we felt some benefit in engaging with the scriptures. So as I say, two questions apiece, five minutes each, and I'm actually first up uh, for tonight. So question one is in reference to Ephesians, one of the letters uh, that we read through. And uh, our questioner directs our attention to verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1. And the question that came out of that was, is this a specific time or a process? So uh, it's five minutes on the clock and it's over to me. Well, thanks for the question. Um, I'm going to read uh, just those two verses just to to give us the context. So it actually begins in, at the end of verse 8. With all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And I think it's important that we take it in context, otherwise we, we might miss what's been talked about here, um, because it's helping us see that there came a point where God decided it was the right time to reveal this mystery, um, which God had purposed in Jesus, and that is to, to bring all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, to bring unity to all things. And it began by Jesus coming at Christmas, coming in the flesh. And that's when it began. And, and then when he came to start preaching, I've just been looking at this in a Bible study. He said, the, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom was breaking in. And we, we journey with Jesus through the scriptures as we've been reading at the start of the year through the book of Mark. We see his power and his authority. Um, bringing uh, unity there, bringing healing, bringing wholeness, uh, bringing creation back to, to what it was meant to be like, uh, but not fully either. And then we journey with Jesus up to Easter and the cross and Jesus is crucified. He dies and then he is raised to life. And we know that after that, after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. So we begin to see the kingdom breaking in. And we know from... Um, what we've been reading in Colossians, that um, on the cross, Jesus uh, overcame the powers and principalities of the world. So again, bringing all things under his authority. But at the same time, <coughs> we don't see this perfectly. We don't see it perfectly in the Gospels, and we don't experience it perfectly now either. And so there's a phrase that goes around um, in 
church circles, theological books, that the kingdom is now and not yet. So the kingdom has partly come through Jesus coming, dying, rising, ascending. We see the kingdom coming and, and broadening out across the world. But also, we don't live in the full reality of that yet. And we await Jesus returning. And that is when we will see all things brought into unity under him. And we know from what we were looking in our Sunday services in Philippians that Paul writes that one day every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. Every knee. All things at that point will be under his authority and he will reign perfectly over all. He has all authority. He is fully God as he says at the end of Matthew, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. But he waits to bring in his full kingdom. And he has to wait because otherwise um, he has to wrap up everything and there's no opportunity to respond to the good news as we're reminded in the book of James. So he delays out of kindness. Uh, and that's why we don't see his full kingdom yet. I've still got just over a minute on the clock. I'm not really going to say much more. So I wonder if Sandra or Jim have anything that they would like to chip in. Have you got anything, brother Jim? or sister? I think it's, it's interesting to me, um, the whole idea of kingdom, uh, particularly given the events of the last week or so um, to do with the royal family and uh, people's attitude to 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 kings and queens and um, and how how um, how that works, how that operates. And of course, Jesus' kingdom is quite different. Um, uh, but I think it, I think there is a, an element of the kingdom. You can be a king, but still have some of your subjects not recognise your your royal um, privilege or whatever. Um, and of course, that's, I suppose, to some extent, that's that's where we're at right now um, with Christ's kingdom. Um, he's the king, but but there are lots of people who don't recognise his kingship. Mm, mm, definitely. <coughs> thanks, for being, thanks for being succinct, brother. Time is up. So that's hopefully uh, engaged a little bit with that question. And we're going to go on now on to question two. Uh, which is going uh, to be answered for us by Sandra. So jump with us in your Bibles uh, on a couple of chapters uh, into the end of Ephesians chapter 5. And we come to that section 22 to 23 of chapter 5, where um, my NAV now calls it as instructions to Christian households. But we especially have a section referencing wives and husbands. It does go on to speak of children and fathers as well. So um, the question here that was asked to us was, does this recognize a fundamental difference between male and female and wife husband? Or is this a sign of Paul's time rather than our times? And it's Sandra who's going to be on the clock for about five minutes. Um, so sister, over to you. Yes, this has always been a sticky one in many households and in the church at large. But I think that to know <clears throat> what the apostle is getting at, we've got to go back a verse to verse 21. And he says there, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, at first glance, I think that sounds highly illogical, and it is art from Christ. And what Paul had in mind was that as Christians, we reject all self-centeredness and work for the good of others. Submission in this context is nothing more than a decision regarding the worth of others. Our society nowadays, well, it very much emphasizes equality, which means an ongoing battle of rights. Everyone wants the rights. Equality, as we know, can, of, can and often does exist without love. And as such, 
It will never create a, a Christian community. Mutual submission means that we give up on our right, rights and support each other. Therefore, submission is love in action. And it brings about the much sought after equality, an equal valuing of each other by which a Christian community not only establishes itself, but is an effective vehicle for our outreach in, to others in Christ's name. Mm -hmm. Our text underscores the love and lordship of Christ, that he is head of the church and our submission to him is paramount. And for all of us, our duty is to help others to find the purposes of Christ in their own lives and in the local congregation where God has set them. And Ephesians 5.25 points to the love Jesus demonstrated on the cross and the marriage analogy points to the continuing love of Jesus for the church. Paul's whole concern in these verses is about love, the love of Christ for us, our love for and worship of Christ. Mutual submission won't allow us to promote ourselves, mm -hmm. but neither does it make us doormats. And it's not wrong to seek justice. Both Jesus and Paul stood up for their own and others' rights. But if we do take that path and seek justice, we must be motivated by love. Love for others in the community of faith rather than self. And too often these verses have been taken both inside and outside the church to mean that men can control women or, or that women must be kept in a subservient role and that husbands always make the decisions. They've even been used to justify abusive behavior of all sorts, but even apart from abuse, these attitudes of men, sad to say, towards women can often be demeaning of them. However, it must be said that in these days of strident feminism, that can also be true of women's attitudes to men. Both are wrong and totally against not only what the apostle is saying here, but against the will of God. They've even been distorted by some who speak about the husband's umbrella of authority. And so much emphasis is placed on the husband as head. He's seen as a privileged authority figure and wives are reduced to second class status. Headship in this context has nothing to do with privilege. Rather, it is the servant character of authority. Wives have responsibility for their actions, but they are also of equal value. What is said here is only an example of the love and mutual submission required of all Christians. Apparently, indeed, the word submit doesn't even appear in the Greek text. Wives, we are told, have to submit to their husbands. That is, they stand in a giving relationship to their husbands in exactly the same way as their husbands do to them. Arguments about hedge, the analogy of the headship of Christ and that of husband cannot conclude that the headships are identical. I think it should go without saying that husbands are different from Christ. 
Christ is Lord over all things. The husband, he isn't Lord over anything. Sorry about that, chaps. Mm -hmm. The point of the marriage analogy is the responsibility husbands have to give themselves to their wives as Christ gave himself for the church. They must love their wives as they love themselves. The two partners are assumed to be one, mutually enabling each other. But first and foremost, they must be in, a, in submission to our Lord Jesus Christ. The real head of a marriage is always Christ. And both partners live in mutual submission to one another, seeking to promote each other within the purposes of Christ and to live out the oneness of their relationship. This was startling stuff for Paul's readers. In that age, women were normally viewed as inferior. In fact, they often weren't even treated as second class. They came much lower somewhere after the sheep and cattle. Jesus was foremost in demonstrating that women were of equal value in his eyes. For example, in John 4, he spoke to the woman at Sychar's well. Now, for a man to speak to a woman at all just wasn't done. And especially a woman with her background and a Samaritan at that. After the resurrection, as a result of the testimony of the women, Peter and John went to the tomb, which of course was empty. They went off home, but Mary Magdalene stayed weeping. And it was to Mary, a woman, that Jesus first revealed himself and gave her the commission, go and tell my brothers. A woman was the first to testify to Christ's resurrection, not as we might have expected the disciples. And Paul in Galatians 3 speaks of our equality before God when he says there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And as we saw last month, Paul worked with women as he brought the message of the gospel to those who hadn't heard. He could say that Euodia and Syntyche labored with him in the cause of the gospel. Sadly, there are still many, not only in other lands, but our own, who view women in ways that are totally at variance with how God views them and how the church should view them. Thankfully for many, these views are changing as women are called by God to take their place in the ongoing mission of the church. Amen. Thank you, sister. Um, lots to take on board there, but really helpful. Thank you so much. Jim, we're on to you with question number three, uh, which is referencing Hebrews 13, 17. And the question put to us was, in what ways do you think we need to contribute to the joy of your leadership, um, not its drudgery? So, Jim, you've got five minutes on the clock. Over to you. Okay. Interestingly, I think this question relates quite closely to um, the question that Sandra has just answered because it's a question of um, ideas that are unpopular today, the ideas of obedience and submission. Um, the first part of the question asked about um, does this include, does, does pastoral leaders include elders? And of course it does. Um, and the simple answer to that to, to the question about how to contribute to their joy is to follow their guidance and their leadership. Um, so what we're being told here, I think, 
in Hebrews 13 is um, that we should obey our leaders and submit to their leadership. Um, that's a, a kind of simple, simplistic answer to the question. Uh, there are lots of other uh, places in the New Testament where we could read more about this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, um, where I, who am an elder myself, appeal to the elders among you. And he goes on to say, do your work not for mere pay, but for my real desire to serve. So he's, he's calling the leaders to be servants. Um, and he, he talks about not trying to lord over those who have put, been put in your care, but to be examples to the flock. And then he goes on to speak about uh, to, to, to the younger folk who are not the leaders, um, saying that they must submit themselves to their elders uh, and, and that everyone should put, put on the apron of humility um, and to serve one another. Because, uh, uh, and, and First Peter quotes the scripture, God resists the proud, God resists the proud, but shows favour to the humble. Um, so it, it's, about, it's about obedience and it's about submission and it's about humility. Um, I, just for, for a wee bit of personal experience, I've, during my, my full-time ministry, I had three charges uh, in three different parts of the country. Two of them were a real joy and blessing, um, but one was a bit of a challenge. In fact, it was a serious challenge, so much so that, that I really considered leaving the ministry um, and questioned why God had called me into that situation, uh, because there were people in the congregation and on the church session uh, who challenged and resisted everything that I tried to do. And that that's demoralizing um, and it's exhausting. Uh, as a minister, it, it, it exhausts you if you feel as if you're continually trying to um, fight opposition within your own congregation. Um, and it has effect, it had a, it had a um, serious effect on my own me mental health, but it affected my family. But not only, it didn't just affect me and, and my family, it affected the, the whole church. Mm. Um, if, it, if people are not um, contributing to their leaders, um, what's the word? Uh, well be The joy of their leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they're doing the opposite, it, um, it makes it so hard and, and everyone in the church suffers. Uh, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that Christians should always just unquestioningly accept everything that their minister or their elder says and, and un unquestioningly, unquestioningly um, follow what they say. Mm. But I think there comes a time when... We need to trust that God has called people into a position of, of leadership in a church. And we, whatever our thinking or whatever our um, level in the church, we have to have the humility to, to get on board with that and to follow where they lead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, there's not much time left, so I'm not going to open it up for other contributions just now. Probably bring that uh, timer to a close there. But thank you for that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, interaction we get in the, the live chat on this one as well. I'm sure there are many more questions. So I'll direct people to you, Jim, if they've got a question for you uh, to pick that up with you. I'm sure you're more than happy to engage with that. So if you've got a contact for Jim, get in touch if you've got more questions off the back of that. Question four, uh, back to Sandra and staying in Hebrews, but also referencing Matthew chapter five as well. And I'm going to read out uh, the full question here just to give us the context. It was Hebrews 8.13 says, by calling this covenant new, God has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Yet Matthew 5.17 says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And the question was, how do they relate to each other? 
Sandra, uh, we're back to you and you've got five minutes on the clock. In these two passages, Hebrews and Matthew, we find the relationship of two religions. On the one hand, we've got traditional Judaism, God's old covenant with his people, and then his new covenant. One of the big differences was that the old covenant, one face of it, was easier. It was just that there were lots of rules and regulations you had to abide by. Whereas the new covenant is all about relationship, relationship with God through Jesus. And God's interaction with his people under the old covenant, often known as the covenant of law, was no less magnificent than the new covenant of grace. But the old covenant was provisional, a bit like having a provisional driving license. It looked forward. It looked forward to much more than just being able to drive a car. But to the new covenant, the outworking of God's grace for humanity. And throughout the pages of the Old Testament, there's the constant promise of the new, the promise of the coming Messiah who would make all things new. And Jeremiah in chapter 31 tells us a wee bit of God's intention. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. And the Jewish people were brought up with the expectation of the coming of newness, specifically the coming of their Messiah. The only problem, of course, was that when he did come, it wasn't what they wanted or expected. Then when John the Baptist came and he was teaching the forthcoming arrival of the kingdom of heaven, it brought anticipation, but also tension. The religious establishment weren't quite sure what he meant. And then, of course, Jesus came. And he was both implicitly and very explicitly criticizing the religious establishment. And that brought even greater tension and downright opposition. And they had the suspicion that Jesus perhaps wasn't fully orthodox in his commitment to the Old Testament. So Jesus, in this discourse in Matthew, makes clear his understanding of and commitment to the Old Testament when he says, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. He's pointing out to them that their awaited Messiah has arrived, he's here and now. The Apostle Paul is at pains to let us know the importance of the Old Covenant when he says that God hasn't rejected his ancient people. And in Romans says, all Israel will be saved. But the difference between the two covenants is very real. In the Old Testament, you've got the sacrifices for sin, while Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for all sin. And so animal sacrifice is redundant. The Old Testament prophets were sinful men. Jesus was the perfect high, great high priest. The writer to Hebrews chapter 8 affirms that Christ <clears throat> excuse me, is at the centre of the purposes of God and everything in the Old Testament is intended to communicate God's will, not just to the people of Israel at that stage of life, but his will for the ongoing life of humanity, which would find its fulfilment and fullest meaning in Jesus. So Jesus came in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, 
And in his coming, we are offered a new and closer relationship with God. Outward conformity to the law isn't sufficient. What Jesus demands is heart transformation. Given the foregoing, we can see that the coming of the new covenant of grace means that the old covenant of law has in many ways passed into history because we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And the word obsolete means that something's lost its usefulness. But having said that, the new covenant doesn't mean that Christians are exempt from exhibiting the indwelling life of Christ in their day-to-day -day practices. The Ten Commandments haven't passed away, but they're fulfilled in Jesus' new commandment, which neatly wraps all of them into one, when he says, love one another as I have loved you. Our lives have to exemplify Christ's life within. And furthermore, and lastly, the Old Testament still has ongoing relevance because many of the prophecies have still to be fulfilled. God hasn't forgotten about the promises he gave to people of old. It's just his time hasn't come. And as we know, his timing is perfect. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. Much appreciated. It's good to lead us into that and to remind us again of that tension in all the new kingdom at the end there uh, question five um is back to jim and we're back we're sticking with hebrews um since obviously it had a, a lot of questions uh, as we go through that and trying to engage and and draw upon it and, and see what the lord might be saying to us so we're looking at hebrews chapter nine and um the question was taken again from the message translation. Um, one of our readers and questioners found it helpful to engage with the message translation for, for Hebrews. Uh, so that might be something worth uh, exploring yourself maybe sometime. And um, just to, to give the, the context to the question, Hebrews 9 suggests that our religious and moral practices are dead-end efforts to make ourselves respectable. And that Christ's sacrifice is the only way to true cleansing and salvation. So that was their context. Their question was, how do we ensure that our historical and religious practices are truly righteous? So, Jim, five minutes on the clock. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, this is quite a big question. Uh, and I suppose we've seen throughout the history of the, the Christian church how religious practices, which may have started off as genuine and pure um, have deteriorated and become ends in themselves rather than the tools or the devices that are meant to help us in our, our service or our worship of our Lord. So when it when it talks when, when the message talks about dead end efforts to make ourselves look respectable, um, well I, I don't actually think that's a, a an accurate translation of uh, the passage, I actually do think it, it captures something of the meaning behind the passage. Um, dead end efforts is really, it's referring to sin. Sin leads to death. Um, and uh, as Sandra's been telling us again, that the Old Testament sacrifices offered a temporary reprieve from that death from that death sentence, if you like, by uh, blood sacrifices of animals, but it had to be repeated continually. Whereas Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is a once and for all sacrifice for the sin of all people. To use a, an old fashioned phrase, um, that I was once approached on a street in St. Andrews with. Um, someone walked up to me and said, have you been washed in the blood of the lamb? Uh, he had no way of knowing that I was, at that time, a divinity student and, and knew what he was talking about. Um, and if, I, I think if I hadn't been, I might have been a bit shocked or more shocked by it. 
But in actual fact, of course, it's, it's an accurate description of, of we as Christians have been washed in, in the blood of Christ. Um, and because of that, we no longer need to repeat that sacrifice. Because Jesus has made the sacrifice once and for all, and it never needs to be repeated. But we fall into the trap of thinking that somehow our religious practices can earn our salvation. If you ask us, we know we will we, we'll tell you we know that that's not the case. But nevertheless, we, we fall into that trap um, of thinking that what we do um, somehow uh, earns our salvation. The whole point of Jesus' sacrifice is that none of us can earn our salvation. That's why his sacrifice was necessary. He did for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. So I suppose the answer to the question is um, the, the question of how we ensure that our historical and religious practices are truly righteous, um, I suppose, is to constantly be aware God is actually not impressed by religious acts. He's impressed by acts of love and service. And read, read the scriptures and you'll find that from, in the Old Testament and the New. Um, Prophet Isaiah in chapter 1 tells us that quite clearly. And Amos in chapter 5, God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals, your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. If ever our religious practices, and, and that can mean a whole host of things from buildings to music to traditions to whatever. If ever these things become more important than love and service, then we need to turn away from them and turn back to Christ. Thank you, Jim. Much appreciated, sir, and drawing us to that. Um, again, at times uh, marching on, so I'm just going to drop the last 20 seconds there. And uh, thanks for leading us in our fifth question. And now we turn to our last question of today, question six, which will be for me. Uh, it was referencing to Galatians chapter one, but clearly I'm not going to be uh, mentioning all of that uh, or reading it all out. But the question uh, says, this chapter exudes Paul's absolute certainty and boldness. How can we achieve a measure of that confidence? Great question. And I've got five minutes on the clock. Well, thanks for that question. And um, just to, to set the context, we know that Galatians is, is Paul's letter to a church that are in trouble. <laughs> they they have lost their confidence. They have been um, blindsided by other people who have come and said, oh, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You also need to add all these other practices on. Um, so interesting that we actually ended up choosing this just after Jim's last question as well about religious practices. Um, and they had lost confidence in Jesus and, and the faith in Jesus alone. And, and so they, they were led astray. And so Paul writes this letter and brings a challenge. And normally he's, he's very positive. And this is what I've been praying for you at the start of his letters but no such prayer at the start of Galatians. He's straight in and oh, hard hitting straight away because he's so worried for them. He loves them dearly. This church that had been planted and yet now in trouble. So Paul challenges them. And yes, he comes across with that certainty, that boldness and that confidence. And I think what, I think helped him to have that was that he had that personal relationship with Jesus in the first place. Here was a man who had been steeped in Judaism, steeped in the ways of the Old Testament, was a Pharisee of Pharisees, 
and yet knew that it didn't lead to life. Knew a lack of peace uh, with God um, and strove uh, for more and just was left empty and, and yearning. And yet when he came to faith in Jesus and Jesus accosted him on the way to Damascus, he came into that relationship with God through Christ and that peace that he had been yearning for. And it changed his whole life. And he, he turned around from being a persecutor of the church to being an apostle of the church and planting churches. So that relationship with Jesus and, and receiving from Jesus that life he yearned for gave him great confidence. He knew then that what he had before wasn't sufficient or necessary now, that it's faith in Christ that brings us into that newness of life. And so I think the same is true for us, that we need to be investing in our own personal relationship with Jesus, growing in love of Jesus. Um, because if it's a real relationship, then there should be that that bond, that deepness of love. Uh, Sandra w- was talking earlier, um, a reference into Ephesians. And the basis of that is, do, have we received Christ's love and are, are we given that love to one another? Um, so the love of God and knowing that for ourselves is so crucial for everything. And I think part of that for me is not only about are we reading the scriptures, are we praying, but I think part of also the confidence factor is are we able to talk about our faith with one another? I have a discipling relationship with someone in the congregation just now, um, and it's really great. Um, But we found that one of the things that is is really helping us both to grow in faith, because I'm getting as much from the conversation uh, as they are, is to talk about our faith. Um, I do an awful lot of talking about church meetings uh, and church business. um, And yes, I spraff on for 50 minutes on a Sunday morning, uh, but actually it is really beneficial just to have the time in the week where you talk about faith with other people in an intentional way. And I think too often we we limit our faith into our minds or we limit it to Sunday and it's all one way traffic, what the minister's saying, um, what other people are praying, but we don't articulate it ourselves. And I think both of us have found in this discipling relationship, as we've both shared, then we've thought about our faith differently and it's grown our faith and nurtured our faith such that we're even more confident about our faith now and more passionate about our faith. And uh, I think if we are to grow in confidence, then we need to talk about our faith and we really need to invest in that relationship with Jesus so that we, are, we know his love, we have received his love, we speak of his love and we respond in love. And when we're there, then we know true confidence, uh, just like Paul. Time's up. And that was our final question for this evening. So thank you to everyone for uh, your questions that that came in. I'm hopeful that uh, what we've shared uh, will give you some answers to begin with. But as with last time, if you've got a question you didn't have answered, or if what we've shared uh, has prompted another question for you, then please do get in touch. Um, Not just with me, Sandra and Jim as well, or maybe your own uh, locum or minister if you're from another church and say, oh, I was reading this or I was hearing this. What do you think? Get in touch. As we said last time, we love to talk about the faith. So do get in contact. Um, Our New Testament reading plan continues. Uh, We're now into uh, Luke's Gospel um, and then on to Acts as well after that. Um, So a a different feel, different pace of things uh, and hopefully we are hearing the Lord through that and growing in our faith. So do get in your questions for this. Um, We need the questions in by the 8th of April, please. 8th of April, that's a Thursday. Um, And probably what we're looking to do is uh, stream our next Q&A evening on the 27th of April, uh, which is actually the last Tuesday of the month, partly because I've got a week off in April and it was just going to be too difficult to make everything fit and juggle, particularly because I've got the video editing to do. So questions in for the 8th of April and then we'll hear that at the end of April on the 27th. So 
Thanks for watching tonight. Thank you to Sandra and to Jim. Much appreciated for your time, both in preparation and the delivery for this evening. And so as we go from here, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen.